All right, uh, so this is the Friday lecture recorded on Wednesday, and we're going to be talking about iteration. Uh, so, I mean, there's some good and bad things about the recorded lecture. The good thing is that you can pause me if you want um, and, and kind of follow through the examples. Uh, the bad thing, I guess, depending on your perspective, is that there's no limit on how long I might make this lecture. Okay, so today we're going to be learning about something called uh, the loop, and in particular there's a kind of loop we're going to learn called the while loop. And so to be starting to learn about this, you should be reading um, chapter 7 of Think Python. And, and the loop is going to let us repeat certain uh, kind of steps in our code uh, multiple times. And so we'll learn how to do that. And, and we're also going to learn some common pitfalls. We're going to learn about something, the infinite, about something called the infinite loop that keeps running forever and, uh, and, and kind of how to avoid those. All right, so this is an example from the pseudocode worksheet that we did earlier in the semester. Uh, when we were trying to go through, and uh, and I think we were trying to compute um, a, a factorial here. And so there's a few things to notice. One is that we had a condition, just like uh, ifs or conditionals that start with a condition, um, our while loop is also going to start with a condition. Um, we have a few steps that we kind of might repeat, uh, do repeatedly. We're going to call those a loop body. And this go back part, uh, we aren't going to have to type anything like that in our code. That will happen automatically, uh, and we'll tell when the loop body is over based on tabbing. Okay, so you'll see that whenever we're doing a loop, there's two possibilities. Either we, um, depending on that condition, either we're going to skip past the loop body and start executing other code, or we're going to do another iteration, is what I'll call it, of running the code inside of the loop. So let's come back to these diagrams we've seen before. Um, you might remember that this was... Uh, well, it's a slight variant of what we did before. Uh, it's a program that takes an input from the user and converts it to a float. And then, depending on, on kind of, well, is it positive or negative, it might have one, one of two things. If it's uh, less than zero, then we are going to print out that, hey, we need a positive number. If it's greater than zero, then we're going to take the square root of it, right? We can't take the square root of a negative number. And then finally, we're going to print exiting. Now. What I want you to think about is when we have this feedback to the user, like, oh, you gave me some bad input, it would be nicer if we could ask them more than once. Well, we keep nagging them until they give us a correct answer, right? So what we'd really like this to look like is something like this, right? On that bad path, we keep going back to the condition and you keep trying again. And, and so that's why this is called a loop, right? There's a circle or a cycle in the control flow uh, diagram. So in that diamond, just like before, it's a condition. This time it's a loop condition. And then that piece that, that runs when the condition is true is, is called the loop body. Okay, so let's try to keep executing while that's true. That's why this is called the while loop. Let's think about what happens if we cross off that line of code. I'd like you to look at that for just a moment. Kind of trace through the code. Okay, so we, we take some input from the user. Let's say we take negative 3, right? So x is negative 3. Is x less than 0? Yes, it is, right? So x is less than 0. And uh, so we're going to run, please print, print uh, please try again. And we jump right back to that condition. Uh, is x less than 0? Of, of course it is. It hasn't changed. And, and so the lesson here is, well, we have an infinite loop. And what we'd like to do to avoid it is make sure that somehow, somewhere in our loop body, we do something that could change the truth value of the condition, right? We change some variables in the loop body that appear in the condition, and that way we might, uh, it doesn't guarantee it will eventually exit the loop, but that's kind of a good sanity check, right? You need to make sure that there's some way for it to make progress. <clears throat> okay, so let's talk about the syntax. Uh, here was the syntax for the f, so you've seen this before. Um, what are we doing here? So we're taking an input from the user, um, an x that we convert to an integer, and then if it's negative, we ask them to try again. So, so they get to try either once or twice. Right after that, it just keeps going forward. If we want them to keep trying until they get it right, uh, it's actually very simple. We can just replace the word if uh, with while, and that means we'll kind of keep going back to that, checking it again and again, until we actually get an x value um, that works for us. Okay, so this will give them an arbitrary number of tries. Well, let me just show this flow in one more way. 
So I'm going to say while condition colon. And then after that, there's going to be a block of code. Maybe it's one line, many, maybe it's many lines of code. Uh, maybe it contains ifs that contain sub blocks, right? But it's going to check very at the very beginning if that condition is true. Um, if it's false, it might jump to the end and it never runs any of that code even once, right? That's totally possible. Uh, but if it's true, it's going to run that block of code and then go back and check that condition again and then run that block of code. And it keeps going through that loop. Um, until presumably, well, hopefully somewhere in that block of code, we have something that changes the variables and makes that condition become false so that we can actually finish. So I'd like to take a moment to kind of congratulate you, right? Uh, uh, one of the first things to learn when you're programming is about control flow. And as I said early in the semester, there's these four concepts to get, right? That generally we move forward one step at a time. And then there's these three important cases where we don't go one step at a time. One is function calls, which are these mini programs. We, we learned that uh, first. Uh, we spent a couple days on conditionals. And then finally, we have these while loops where sometimes we go back to a previous line of code, right? So once you kind of master these uh, and become very comfortable with them, uh, you'll have mastered control flow more broadly, one of the big three things we teach this semester. Okay, so I'm going to spend most of the time doing some coding demos and to kind of just get you used to how this is working. Some of these will be in Python Tutor, some will be in a notebook. Okay, well, one of the things we can do with loops is we can count. And this is kind of a complicated example, so let me start with a simpler example. I'm going to head over to, I'm going to, head over to Python Tutor, and let me make this larger. There we go. And, uh, and, and let's say I want to, what do I want to do? I want to count from, uh, let's count from 0 to 9 and print each of those numbers. Okay, well, what do I do? I, I'm going to have this count somewhere, and so I'm going to put that in a variable. I'm going to put that in a variable called count, and well, that's going to start at something, and then I'm going to have a while loop that will check something, and uh, well, in this loop, I want to print the count, and uh, well, well, let's start filling this in, right? I'm going to say I, I want to start at zero. And how far do I want to go? Well, I, I could write this multiple ways. I could say while count is less than or equal to 9, that would work. Or I could say count is less than 10. Well, let's just step through this a little bit. You see I actually have an error because I'm not finished writing it. But let's see what's happening right now. OK, I'm going to well, let me make this a little bit larger even. OK, I'm going to step through this. Okay, so I have my count variable, it's starting at zero. Well, is that true? Yeah, zero is less than 10. So I'm gonna print zero. Is count less than 10? Yeah, zero is still less than 10. Yeah, zero is always less than 10, right? This is an example um, of an infinite loop. I guess the first loop I showed you is a bad loop. So what we need to do, right? Remember the, the tip I gave? Somewhere in the loop body, do something that could make the condition true, right? And, and in particular, right, uh, this is going to mean that we change the variables of the loop condition, right? That's how I make this eventually true. I change count. So, okay, so I need to change count in some way. I'm going to say count equals well, the first time I go through, I want it to be 0, and I'm going to print that. The next time I through, I want it to be 1. So, so really, it should be something like count plus 1. And let's try this. And, and really, well, I should make this a simpler example. I'm just going to count to 4. Right, so 4 means I just want to do this while this is less than 5. Right, 4 is the biggest number that is less than 5, the biggest integer. OK, I'm going to step through this now. Uh, 0 is less than 5, so I'm going to print count, which is 0. Count equals count plus 1, right? So my variable is going to change to 1, right? It's 1 now. Is 1 less than 5? Yes, that's still true, right? So I'm going to keep going through here. 
Mm -hmm. Each time through, I increase it by one. And once I get to, well, four is the last pass. When it becomes five, th this is where it gets interesting. Um, if you're trying to learn how this arrow works, you might think that the arrow is going to go to line seven now, uh, but it doesn't. It goes back up, and it does one last check. It is count less than five? That's false, right? So after six, it goes to four, and then after that, it bounces down. And well, if I had a print statement down here, it would it would jump to that next, right? If I had more code, right? It does that as the last step. Okay, so let's try some other examples. Let's try, mm, let's try counting from three to negative three. And, and so I'm gonna maybe put this down here. Uh, well, so three to negative three. Well, one of the things, so I mean, I guess there's kind of a few places where I should think about changing this loop. Whenever you're doing these counting loops, it actually becomes, you know, it looks complicated at first, but it's kind of formulaic, right? Uh, it's going to look something like this, right? These are the pieces I have to ch change when I'm counting. Every counting loop looks something like that. Well, what do I start at? I, I start at 3. And I want to... Well, what am I going to do down here? I want to go 3, 2, 1, 0. Well, so really what I want to do is I want to... I mean, I just want to subtract one each time through. And, and remember, when I say something like this, count equals count minus one, I could have, I could just say, well, minus equals one. Before, I could have said plus equals if I wanted to. I guess I just didn't bother. And uh, in this case, well, well, I actually see that well, I want to go until negative three. I want negative three to be the last number. I may say greater than or equal to here, right? Negative three is the last pass I want to do through this. All right, so let's let's step through this. Okay, so count is three. While count is greater than or equal to negative three, that's still true. I print three. Okay, count minus equals one. So minus equals one means that three becomes a two. And I jump back to the top. Two is still greater than or equal to negative three. All right, so I'm going to jump past that. I'm going to print 2, and uh, I'm going to go from 2 to negative 1. I'm going to start going a little faster here. You kind of see that. It just keeps cycling, cycling, cycling. And uh, and as always, right, I want to kind of think carefully about this end case, right? So I have, well, count as negative 2. It's going to become negative 3. And I go back to the top. Right after I run this, it jumps right back here. Is negative 3 greater than or equal to negative 3? It is, right? So I'm going to do one more iteration, and I'm going to get my negative 3. And, uh, well, okay, I'm going to subtract once more, right? So now I'm going to get count equals negative 4. And this isn't true anymore. All right, so I'm going to step down here, and I'm done. So notice that when I'm using this count thing, uh, usually it ends one past whatever I'm counting over. All right, so let, let's head back to that example now and, and try to um, uh, do something a little more complicated. Um, let's say we want to have a kitchen timer and, uh, and maybe we're baking something. We want it to make some noise when we're done. Okay, so well, let me head over here to, you know, I think maybe this is a good example to do an idle. All right, so I'm going to head over to idle. Uh, and, uh, and you can, of course, create this code wherever you like. Um, I have a place where I keep it on my computer, but um, maybe you'll put it somewhere else. So we're on lecture. Right now we're on lecture 11. All right, so I'm going to go to lecture 11. Oh. And this is just where I keep it organized on my computer. And I'm going to say idle. And uh, maybe, if you, you know, maybe you do idle 3 if, um, if you're on a Mac. But I'm going to say idle, and I'm going to uh, call my program alarm.py. All right. So first things first, let's let's make our counter. Um, well, we want to figure out how many seconds to wait, right? So I'm going to say input uh, how many uh, seconds. 
and uh, and I'm gonna put that in a variable. That's gonna be my start. And uh, and now I wanna I wanna kind of count down count down from start to zero. All right, so I'm gonna do count count minus one, so on and so forth. So maybe maybe I'll say remaining. Maybe that's what my variable will be. I'll say remaining equals start. And I want to say while remaining, remaining seconds is greater than or equal to zero. You kind of see where these variables are showing up, or these values, right? That's not a variable, that's a literal. Well, that's greater than or equal to zero. I may print while remaining. And then I'll maybe print the word um, seconds left. Okay. Uh, and, and then and then when I'm all done, I want to print. Well, I'm in, it's going to be an aggressive alarm. I'm going to have it print print that 20 times. All right. Let's run this program. So, well, I, I can just say F, F5 on my computer, so I'm going to do that. And uh, how many seconds? Well, let's do 60 seconds. And, oh, something's not quite right here. Uh, the first thing I should figure out is what line of code did it crash on. It crashed on line 6. Well, because I can't use this operator on both stir and int. Okay, so I should look where that's happening. Uh, you can see down here in the bottom right there's line 6. Oh, I kind of landed right on it, right? So what did it say? It said I cannot use greater than or equal to on... Well, I can't use it on stir and uh, end, right? So the, what it's really saying is that this is a string and uh, and this is an end. Well, why, why would that be a string? Well, where did it come from? Remaining came from start, start came from, oh, you know, I, I see it, right? This always returns a string, so I ought to convert that to an integer. All right, we're making progress. Let's run this now. So I'm gonna run this, and how many seconds? 60 seconds. All right, and oh my, I, I think I accidentally wrote an infinite infinite loop here, right? So I just hit Control-C on my keyboard. Control-C will kill that with this keyboard interrupt error. All right, so keep that handy. Right now that you're doing loops, you're going to probably do, be doing that a lot. Well, what, what did I forget? I mean, if this is true, it's always going to be true, right? Because nothing inside of the loop body changes remaining, right? So I'm just going to say remaining minus equals one, and then try running that. How many seconds? Three seconds. Three, two, one, and then beep, 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 beep. Okay, uh, that's working a little bit better. Um, it, it, to me, that felt like that was a little fast. I don't think the cookies are done in the oven yet. Um, so I have to have some way to introduce time. And, uh, and how am I gonna do that? Well, I'm, I'm gonna teach you a new module, and a new function. Let me, I'm leaving this one alone, right? If I kill this, idle will die. But I'm going to open up a new window, and I'm going to go to interactive mode. I'm going to go to Python 3, and I'm going to import the time module. And, uh, and then there's a function in the time module called sleep, right? Because I, I, did, I didn't say from time import star. If I did, I wouldn't need this part. But since I did this style, import module name, I need to say module name dot sleep. And uh, that takes some number of seconds. I want to sleep for three seconds. I run that, and it's, it's working, and it's done, right? Or maybe I do it a little bit shorter. One second, and it's done. So th this is what I'd like. I would like to sleep for one second on each pass through this loop. Okay, so I'm going to do that. And, uh, well, I need to import it up at top, right? So I'm going to say import time, and I'm going to run that. Welcome to VoiceOver. Oh, that's not what Voice I wanted over to do. Speaks description. Bye, VoiceOver. Okay, let me try. Why, why did I do that? I thought I was hitting F5. There we go. So how many seconds? Let's say two seconds. One, two, three. Oh, that's a little bit wrong, right? What, what do I really want to do now that I'm kind of sleeping in here? Hmm, that, that's too long. I, I need to, you know, I want to sleep this time. I want to sleep this time. I don't want to sleep here anymore. 
So, so really, I'm just trying to say, well, when there's zero seconds left, I'm going to get rid of that, right? When there's zero seconds left, we'll know because it's beeping, right? So I'm going to run this, and uh, let me head back here. And three, oh, there's my three. Okay, three, two, one, beep, beep, beep. Okay, so it's working pretty well so far. Uh, let, me, let me do one more thing. Well, a couple more things. One is that you see that whenever I type this, there's no space there, right? I should probably I should probably put an extra space there just to make it better. And then, you know, unless I'm watching my computer screen, I might not notice that. Um, now, now I'm just trying to, for fun, I'm going to do something that you, you can't quite do on your computer because I have a module that you don't have, right? Let me, let me show you. So I have this file, beeper.py, and I'm going to um, use that, right? And, and, and so that's only a module on my computer. Um, so that's not a crucial part of the example, but let me head back here to idle. And uh, I'm going to import that, right? So I'm going to say import beeper. And uh, right, so I, this is going to work for me because I have that. And I'm going to say beeper dot, I, I wrote that module, so I happen to know it has a beep function. And that, you know, instead of having, um, you know, I have to say how many times I want it to beep. So let me run this. All right. How many seconds? Uh, let's do 12 seconds. Uh, I should have done fewer seconds. Mm. Beep, 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 beep. <laughs> All right, and then there we go. So I'm a little disappointed. This is a video lecture. I usually like to crank that up full volume and kind of wake everybody up. Well, anyway, so that's an example there. We can kind of have this kitchen timer, right? Maybe you can use that when you're baking. Let, let me head back here now to some more examples. Mm, this is a good example. Uh, here, here I, I have an equation, right? F of, well, I guess it doesn't quite say f, but you can imagine a function y equals f of x, and f of x is 5 minus x minus 2 squared. And I, and I just pulled that into Google, and it plotted that for me. And the question is, where where does this curve peak? And uh, and if you've taken calculus, maybe it's not a hard math problem, right? You can take the derivative and set it to 0 and, and kind of find the peak of it. Uh, but this isn't a math class. In a calculus class, uh, we're going to write some code to do this example. Okay, so let me head over to my notebook, and uh, and I'm going to create, well, you can see I'm in the same place where I wrote alarm.py and I have my beeper.py. I'm going to create a new uh, notebook and that I'll use for this lecture. And, well, let me make sure I grab that function, all right? I want to get that right. And maybe I'll just define that. I'm going to say f of x, I'm going to return 5 minus x minus 2. 2 squared, right? So I, I could try a few values through there. Um, for example, if I say f of, well, let's say f of 0, I get 1. Is that is that right? Um, right, so I guess this would be negative 2. And uh, right, 0 minus 2 is negative 2. Squared is 4. 5 minus 4 is 1. Okay, that seems about right. Uh, let's try that. f of 1. Well, 1 minus negative 1, I'm sorry, 1 uh, minus 2 is, is, well, negative 1. Negative 1 squared is 1. 5 minus 1 is just 4. Okay, so I, I think this is working. What, what I'd like to do now is I'd like to try lots of different values of f and find out which one gives me the biggest y. Okay, so, so how are we going to do this? I'm going to say for... Mm, I, I want to try different x values, right? So I'm going to say, uh, sorry, I, what am I typing? I'm going to have a while loop. Um, maybe let me just eyeball this. I'm going to head back to here. I'm going to try a very small number to kind of start, and then I'll eventually end up with a very large number. And I'm just going to try every possible combination. Uh, that's the beauty of computing, right? right? I can kind of brute force it. I can try a lot of different things. And since it's a computer, it won't take me very long. All right, so I'm going to come back here, and I'm going to say x equals negative 10. 
and while while x is less than or equal to 10 well maybe let me just print this off first I'm going to say x plus equals 1 and let me run that oh and what do I have here this is on line 2 well x is less than or equal to 10 great here's all these different values of x well, let me actually kind of tidy that up a little bit so it fits okay uh, Oh, excuse me. Let me just make this a little bit bigger for you. Oh, what is happening? Okay. There we go. Oh, no, not quite like that. There we go. Now you have all the real estate. Now, now what I would like to do is not only print the x values, but print the y values, right? So I'm going to say y equals f of x. Right, I'm going to run this line of code many times, right? I'm going to say, what is y of negative? When I have x is negative 5, what is it when it's negative 4, and so on and so forth. Right, so I'm going to call it a bunch of times, and each time I'm going to print off my x and my y. So, well, well what do I have here, right? So I see that when x is negative 5, I get this. You know what I should really do is I should really be very explicit, right? Uh, what, why confuse myself, right? When x is negative 5, y is negative 44. And, and if I, you know, I could eyeball it, I could draw through here and I could see, well, the biggest y, well, is 5, and when, it, when I'm there, I have x equals 2, right? So I could say, well, x equals 2 maximizes the, maximizes the function, right? So I can see that, but I really want the computer to tell me that. So, so here, here's what I want to do. I want to kind of keep track of the x's as I go in, and keep track of which x gives me the biggest y. Alright, how am I going to do that? Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to introduce another variable. Best x equals x. And, uh, and I'm trying a bunch of different x's, and each time I, I compute, well, I, I compute the y for a new x, I want to see if that's bigger than the y I would have gotten for for this one. Maybe, maybe I'll have a best y here too. I'm going to say best y equals, well, if this is the best x, then the best y is just f of x, right? Now, now, now keep in mind, right, I mean this is kind of starting way over here, right? These obviously aren't the best, but my goal goal is that after the loop, best x and best y should contain, well, well, exactly what they describe, right? Here they clearly are not the best x and y, right? I'm not maximizing y, but when I'm done, I would really like for x to be 2, best x to be 2, and best y to be 5. Okay, well, I'm printing all these values, and what, what I want to do is I want to kind of see, well, is this one better than what I've seen before? So I'm going to say if y is greater than best y, you know, I should really think of this as, you know, at, at any time, this is the best so far. That's really the crucial part. Maybe all caps will help help us remember. That's the best so far. And, well, what is so far? I mean, the best so far through here is the best y is negative 20. The best so far through here, well, the best y is 5. The best so far through here is, well, still 5, right? 5 is better than these, right? At the end, the best so far is still, yeah, what we had right here. Right, so what I'm going to do is I keep looping through this. I'm going to keep updating it, increasing best y, best y, until here, and then we're not going to be doing it anymore. So I'm going to say if y is better than best y, well, I want to save this new best y, right? Right, I found a better y, so that's, that's the new one that should go on that variable. And the same thing for the best x. Best x equals x. And, uh, well, let me print this off here. What did I do? I found a new best. Right, and when I'm all done, 
let me let me just print both of these, right? I'll say best x is that one, and the best y is the other one. Let me, let me run that. Okay, so I'm looping through here. Well, I guess this is what my, my best x and my best y started at that. So I didn't, when I do this one, right, I'm not really finding a new best. It's just as good as the old, old one. And what if I change it to this? Right? I'm going to do that. Okay. So at this point in time, that's the best. And then I find at negative 4, I can do negative 33. Negative, I'm sorry, negative 31. That's bigger than negative 44. So that means my new best x and y are, are these. I keep going, 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 right? Y is getting bigger and bigger. I'm finding better and better values. I keep changing these. And well, until I found the best one. Right after I found the best one, any other contender is worse, and I stop updating it. Right, so at the end, my best X and my best Y, well, really came from this time, right? The last time I found a new record or a new high. Right, so I, I can do this, and this can kind of find the best over this range. Uh, well, I'll leave it like that. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll kind of clean this up a little bit now. This was just for my own troubleshooting purposes. I run that, and then it finds the optimal for me. Well, is this really the optimal? Well, let me let me shift this a little bit. Well, well, when is this optimal? I mean, the the most it can ever be is five, right? Because this is positive. Five is the best. Well, when do I get 5? Well, when this is really small. Whenever what I'm subtracting is 0, well, then I get 5, and that's the best. So what would happen if I did something like, well, a little devious. I'm going to say minus 2.5. I change the function. Is, is that true? I, I don't really think that's true, right? I mean, I kind of know that the best x value is... Well, it's the best x value is 2.5, right? When x is 2.5, that gives me the biggest y value, which is 5. Right, so this code is not correct, right? I mean, the answer should be 3.5, and it's kind of a crude approximation. It only gave me 3. And any kind of code like this that's optimizing um, by kind of exploring that space is, well, it's just an approximation, right? But since it's a computer, we can make it a little more fine-grained. We can try more values. And instead of just trying the 10 values, you know, I'm, here I'm trying from negative 5 to 5, why don't I try, like, I don't know, say a 1,000 values? How, how would I do that? Well, maybe, maybe let me print that, right? So uh, let's see if... Let's see if x is a better x value, right? That's what this loop is really doing. It's just trying a bunch of different uh, x values. And so you, you see it only checks it about 10 times. Uh, what if I change this? Instead of this, I do 0 0.1. Then instead of negative 5, negative 4, and so on, well, I see I kind of try many more values. Well, I could even do a smaller, right? Why not? Right? It's a computer. I'm going to try every thousandth. And uh, computers are fast, right? I tried try them all. Now, now this print statement here is getting annoying because I'm printing so many. But I run that, and, uh, and, and now I see I get a very close answer, right? I expected it to be 2.5, and then I got just about that. And you see that does give me a y of 5, right? So fast, look at that. Maybe let me try to make it slow. If I try an even smaller x, then it takes a moment, right? But you can see the power of this, right? I'm trying lots of things and finding the best best answer. Right? It's kind of, when you're programming, you can kind of cheat out of a lot of complicated math problems this way. All right, well, let's, let's do another problem. Oh, that one's going to be too complicated. Let me do this one. Uh, let's figure out what the area is of this quarter circle. Okay, well... Well, what, what do I know? Well, what is the area of the whole circle? Let me let me just type that. Before you ever start any code, you should think about what the answer is going to be. Whole circle 
will be what? Right, what if I had a whole circle kind of taking up this whole space, not just one quadrant, right? What if I had that, right? The whole circle would be, you know, pi, something like that, pi r squared, right? And in this case, r is just, well, 2. So, so I mean, really what I would get, the whole circle, the area of it is 4 pi. And, uh, and you can see, well, maybe that's why I did this. So I can kind of get a nice clean answer, right? Uh, pi. Right? The area of this is pi. And we're going to estimate it <coughs> by writing some Python code. Well, how do, how do we do that? Um, there's this trick that if, if you, maybe you've already taken calculus or you'll take it in the future, but the trick is that you can divide it up into all these small little rectangles, and that's a good approximation. Um, now, now, if you're taking calculus, you'll answer the question, you know, what happens is those become arbitrarily small, right? They become smaller and smaller, and I have more and more of them. Uh, what answer does that approach? And in doing that, you get a perfect answer. Uh, we aren't going to get a perfect answer in this class. In this class, we're just going to uh, not make them arbitrary small, but make them really, really tiny. And, uh, and from that, we'll get a good approximation. All right, so we're going to add those up. Well, I'm going to do something like before. I'm going to loop with my x from 0 to 2. And then in each case, I'm going to compute my y. And then I'm going to add up the area of that rectangle. All right, so let's head back here. Uh, and this was example one, right? So, um, example one before was find the x that maximizes the y. In this example two, uh, we're finding the area of a quarter circle with radius two. Okay, well the first thing I want to do is I want to figure out um, what the width of those rectangles are. Maybe I'll say, I'll just put that in, in W. And I'll say the width is 0 0.1. And, uh, well, uh, you know, each of these rectangles are kind of side by side. So for my x's, my x are going to start at 0. And I'm going to say, well, x is less than 2. You, you know, I'm going to come back to this to do add up the total area, right? Well, what do I, I don't want to quite say it like that. I want to add the current rectangle to the total area. That's maybe a little more precise. And, uh, and down here, well, each rect time I go through a new rectangle, I'm going to say x plus equals, well, the width of the rectangle, right? The new rectangle starts when the last one finishes. Okay. You know, whenever I'm doing these loops, I like to kind of just print off what my values are before I actually write the code to make sure it's kind of working properly, right? So I go from 0, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, and all the way up to 1.9. Um, you know, it doesn't quite get to 2, but that, that doesn't matter, right? Because, uh, you know, if I make this smaller, it's going to get very close. And, and I'll eventually do that, but let's keep it simple for now. Well, now we have to compute the y, and uh, y equals, well, what does y equal? Well, you know, there's different ways we could do it. I, I suggested one way here where we could do the arc cosine and the sine functions in the math module. And, uh, you know, that actually seems like a fine thing to do right now. I'm going to do that. Right, so if I, if I have an x value and I do arc cosine, I'm going to get that angle, and I can use that angle to feed into the sine, and then get the height. All right, so I'm going to head back here, and, uh, you know, it's customary that I do all the imports at the top, right? So I I'm going to do that, even though it's right next to this, and uh, import math. And so just remember that. I'm sorry, I'm going to scroll down. And, uh, well, what do I want to do? I want to figure out the angle, and the angle is what? It's the math dot arc cosine of 
Well, I, I, really what this is taking is, it's, it's kind of like what that x value would be for the unit circle. So I want to divide that by the radius, which is 2. You, you, you see here, I'm eventually going to want this to work for other circles, right? I'm kind of doing a bad thing by hard coding that. Maybe I should say radius equals 2 and use that everywhere, right? Oh, I'm going to divide that by radius. Uh, maybe I'm going to print my values, right? So that's my x. Uh, what is my angle? Right, and, and the, these angles are in radians, right? That's why it's not nice numbers like 90 degrees, for example. But I have all these, um, I have all these angles, and from those I could compute uh, y. Right, how would I do that? I just say math dot sine of angle. And, uh, well, I mean, this is going to give me the height for the unit circle. And so I kind of want to multiply that by radius again. Right, so maybe instead of printing off the angle, I'm just going to print off the y's. And, and so I, let, let's, let's try to look at some of the examples here and see if this is making sense. Maybe I'll try to have my circle there. Okay, so when x is 0, right, the height is 2, right? So that's this kind of rectangle right here, right? I, I, I caught that one. Okay, and then as the x gets bigger, right, as I, as I go, say, over here, right, as the x gets bigger, the y should get smaller. And, and that's true, right? And eventually, eventually when my x gets way out to the right, I mean, it's almost at 2, it's almost at the radius, then my y becomes pretty small. Maybe let me try some smaller numbers now. I'm going to say 0 0.1. I kind of start at 0, 2, and all the way down here at the end, I get, you know, it's almost 2, and almost you know, a very short rectangle there at the end. Okay, I'm going to stop printing these things. Uh, and what I want to do now is, well, what is the rectangle area? So I'm going to say the rectangle area is... Well, how wide is it? Well, I kind of put that in my variable up above. That's w. And uh, how tall is it? Well, y, right? At, at that x position, the rectangle is y high. So I'm going to say w times y. And, you know, I want to keep... All the, all the stuff I'm working on is this to-do right here. I should really be kind of having that um, above this, right? And... Uh, well, what, what, what do I want to do? I want to add this to a total, right? So I'm going to create another variable. Total area. Well, it starts at zero because I haven't found any rectangles yet. But every time I, I loop over a new rectangle, I'm going to add that to the total area like so. And, uh, and let's print that out at the end. Well, I'll just put it right here. I'm going to say total area. I'm going to run that. And uh, not bad, right? I said the area of that quarter circle would be about pi. Pi is 3.14. It's a close approximation. Well, let me try seeing if I can do a better pi. I'm going to say 0 0.01. 0 0.14159. Not quite. I mean, how, can I, how good can I get it? 1415. Maybe I can make it even smaller, right? We run that. Now it's actually taking a while, right? Because it's adding up all these little rectangles. Uh, maybe I maybe I made it too small. Uh, and there we go, one four one five nine. Right, it, it's getting us a pretty good idea of how large it is. Right. So a lot of these things you can do in calculus. Right. In calculus, maybe you optimize something by uh, you know taking the derivative and then seeing where it's zero. Uh, we can find the this is a calculus problem, right? We can do that by just brute forcing it, trying a lot of things. Um, in calculus, right, we use integration to find the area inside of some shape. Uh, when we're programming, we can uh, kind of estimate it by just summing up a lot of small pieces. And, uh, and you can imagine that, you know, for, the, for this problem, right, you'd probably use calculus and actually get an exact answer. But uh, imagine you have some sort of function that's hard to 
integrate, right? Maybe you don't know how, or maybe nobody knows how to integrate it. You can certainly get an estimate by writing some Python code instead. All right, so let me head back here. And uh, oh, this is going to be, well, let me at least start this one. How, how can we write a program that finds primes? And uh, this is actually kind of fun because, I mean, this program runs forever, right? I mean, we're never done finding primes. It's going to keep running and printing out more primes and, until uh, we kill the program. Okay, so I'm going to head over here. And, uh, well, maybe the first thing, right, uh, you know, step one is write a function that checks whether a number is prime. All right, this is the next example, right? This was example three, find primes. And if I do that, the step two is keep checking checking numbers using code from step one, print out, oh, print out, oh my gosh, I can't type, print out when it is prime, right? So I think for this, uh, what I'm doing right now, I think this is all I really have time for, but you can think about how you do this step. Okay, so I'm going to write a function called is prime, and it's going to take a number. Okay. And, uh, well, I'm going to say that this um, n, you know, I'm going to assume it's a prime unless I can find something that goes into it. For example, I know that 9 is not prime uh, because 3 goes into it evenly. Maybe I'll just leave that as a comment there since we're kind of thinking through that. So that's what I really want to do. I want to see, well, does any number go into it evenly? So I'm going to say, well, I don't want to check 1, right? So where should I start? If I started at k equals 1 and I checked if that goes into it evenly, well, that'll go into everything evenly. So I just want to check 2, right? 2 is the first prime. And I want to check every number less than n, right? So here I'd be checking 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Uh, okay. I'm going to do that. You can imagine ways to optimize this, right? I mean, I guess, you know, if I haven't found something by 5, well, by 4, right? I'm not trying to have 5 and above. It's not trying to go that evenly. Anything less than half of it, anything more than half of it's not trying to go in, but I'll, I'll just kind of forget about that for now. And, uh, and what I'm going to do is, I kind of want to count these off. So I'm going to say k plus equals 1, and I'm going to print my k's. You know, lots of logic here, and I have to, to do uh, check if it goes evenly. But I'm going to come back to that, right? I want to incrementally develop. So I'm going to say is prime 9. And I see that we're going to check, maybe I'll just say what are we doing here. Uh, check each of these. I'm going to check 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and, uh, how, well, how do I check? How do I do that check? I'm going to try dividing it. I'm going to say n divided by k, and uh, what does it mean that it draws it evenly? It means that there's no remainder, right? When I divide n by k, if there's no remainder, then... What do I know about n? For example, if, you know, 9 divided by 3, the remainder is 0. Well, I know that's not a prime, right? So I'm going to return false. Okay, so let me, let me run this. This is prime. I check 2, I check 3, and already I discovered 3 goes evenly into 9. 9 is not a prime. Well, let's try another number. Let's try 7. Well, well, you see that I actually didn't return anything that time, and so I have to handle that case too. After my loop, right? If I've, if I've, you know, what what am I thinking here, right? If I've if I've checked all of these, and I haven't already returned because I haven't found something that goes into even into it evenly, it must be a prime. I've checked every possible factor, and I can't find one, right? So. 
You know, that's true. Let me, let me clean this up now. Right, so that's true is prime of, um, you know, let's say 16. That's false is prime of 23. That should be true. Yeah, I, I think that checks out. All right, well, let's just try a large number. Is prime of a million. Oh, but even that's pretty fast. All right, I'll leave it off there. You can start thinking about these steps. Uh, maybe I'll do that in the next uh, in the next lecture uh, next week. All right, great. Have a have a good weekend.